So we're talking about layering drums specifically for house music and some of those nice old school house vibes. So what we're going to do is just create a new EXS instrument. Click on the edit window, which opens up this the sample internally. Quite interestingly, when you're inside EXS24, there's a lot of hidden stuff that a lot of people don't know about. One thing is that that window stays open, but you can just close that. And if you do want to open that window, access a filter or an envelope or something like that, you can just open it up here. Okay. So generally speaking, when you're in the editor window, you don't need this window open. So I tend to get it closed. There's nothing worse than windows cluttering up the desktop all over the place. So what we're going to do is create a new instrument from the instrument menu, new. We have a new instrument. We can see that we now have some zones and stuff ready to go. And quite interestingly, from that menu, I know a lot of people still use recycle files, say legacy recycle files, really commonly. So you can actually convert recycle files within EXS24, which is pretty handy for all of those old recycle files that you've got. You can also export the sampler instrument from that pull down. All right, so let's go to zone. We're going to create our first new zone. This is the old school way of doing it. So there's our new zone. Strangely enough, a zone is an area that contains a sample. Obviously, logic is com entirely, completely drag and drop. We can see that our new zone is now spanning the keyboard here. And what we can do is, there's always more than one way. So I could either get that and just drag it to the note that I want it to be on. Because I'm making a kick drum, I want it to be on C1. And then I could drag the other end. Uh, or I could just go up here and do it there under key range. So there's my kick drum on C1. What I'm going to do is layer three kicks together. And I always talk about three types of kick that I like to put together, regardless of the kind of music you're working on. Sub kick, the secret weapon jack kick. That's not the first kick sample I'm going to put in, because the sub kick is usually the last sample I put in. First sample I put in, I want to be the character, what I call the character sample. This is you know, the character of the kick drum, the main perception of what this kick drum sounds like. What I'll also do is add a body kick drum. A body kick drum will just add a bunch of punch and clarity and weight to the kick drum. Layering kick drums is much harder than layering any other drums because what you tend to find is that you get phase problems and what you'll hear is that if you don't adjust the pitchings of the different kick drums, you find that they tend to cancel each other out. So the character kick. This is obviously, as I've said, Loads of times, this is completely drag and drop. I could just drag a sample onto this area here, the keyboard area, uh, actually onto a note. But uh, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. Load audio sample. I tell you what, let's go for um, let's go for something like a DMX actually. Yeah, Oberheim DMX, 32-bit. This one here. Let's get a kick drum. And this is a big part of the process. Is actually really thinking about you know what samples you're going to use, what you're aiming for. And, and thinking in terms of the kick drum being three separate elements that combine to create one element. So what I'm now looking for is not a good all-rounder like this one, but that one has got the, the nice clicky front end to it, which I can then augment with some body kick and some sub kick. So I'm going to go for that one. Okay, and there it is. Let's just repitch it. Let's make it one shot so that it plays to the end of the sample every time. And, you know, I mean, think in terms of 99 out of 100 producers will be just using that as a kick drum. What we're going to do then is let's load in another kick drum. So we're going to go new zone. And let's just going to do the notes here this time. Like so. And let's just load in. Let's load in the sub kick. So, jack kick, there it is. The M here tells you that it's a mono version of the sample, and this will be the stereo version of the sample. There's a lot of debate about mono versus stereo samples for drums, and if you listen to American records, drums are pretty much always in stereo, and you listen to UK records, they're pretty much always in mono. Uh, personally, I prefer stereo 
rounder, richer, warmer, a bit more depth about it, you know. Um, so I'm going to go for Jack Kick in stereo. Let's open that up. And now if we play that key, let's just uh, make sure we fix the pitching in the one shot. We'll hear that with the first sample. And there's your lovely big round bottom end already. Awesome. Just to remind you of what that sounded like before, let's just turn that down. Amazingly different. Now surprisingly, that level seemed to be working quite well. Usually with the jack kit, you've got to be really careful of it and keep it as low in the balance as necessary. What you can get with this jack kit, if you if you use too much of it, is the perception is that the bottom end of the mix is a bit dirty. You could just get a little bit of concentration of sort of 100 hertz with that. And when you hear it, kick drums are always loud in the mix in modern music. So... Be, be really wary of that and always listen to your mix when you're using jack kick and just study that area, you know, that area of the bass, 100 hertz sort of area, where the kick and the bass are really prominent. So you're going to get a lot of, of saturation. Always check that, that you haven't got too much jack kick in the mix. Uh, and also, phasey wise, as we said, they're actually working really nicely together. But as, as a matter of interest, let's try detuning jack kick by one semitone. Immediately, the sound has lost something, hasn't it? Because that phase correlationship isn't working as well as the one a semitone higher. It's getting worse. So I'm going to put that back to zero. It's most unusual that you don't end up retuning jack kick, but there's that. All right, now let's go for a body kick. Let's go for new zone. Okay, and we could, of course, fix these right now. And let's load it in. Let's open it up. And let's just listen to the three together. But I think we've got a problem between two hard kick and DMX kick. So first thing I'm going to do is just pitch two hard kick down one semitone. That immediately works better. Let's just try it down a bit more. That's even better. I'll try another one. Uh, I think two semitones work best. This isn't the best collection of three kicks I've ever heard in my life at the moment. What I'm going to do, though, is two hard kick. We don't want too much of that in there, so let's just take the volume of it down, and then that will give us more of the DMX character back to the, to the kick drum. So let's just take that down about 10. Much better. And if I just take that out, just to compare. It doesn't add a whole lot. And, I'll, you know, I know it seems like a real faff, but I will often spend hours sitting here checking out different combinations of drums and finding combinations that really work well. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? doesn't sound like a DMX anymore, but I didn't really want it to sound like a DMX. I just wanted to create a composite kick that has its own character about it. Let's well, just play around with the tunings a bit. Let's just try tuning the DMX up one. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull both of these down in volume now. So that's going to come down 4 to 10, and that's going to come down 4. So that's going to allow the DMX kick to come up through the mix a bit. And if you wanted something that sounded DMX-y, that's pretty good, isn't it? We're getting that. Let's just put the DMX back to its original tuning. Quite good. Um, something we always should do when we're doing this kind of thing, layering drums together, is edit the drum attack points because you should never assume that the attack point is correct. So a lot of people just hear a kick drum sample and as I say, assume that the attack point is in the right place. And it often isn't. This one looks pretty good. Let's just pull it a bit tighter. That's actually really good. And check the release as well. Um, sometimes 
with samples, you'll just get a whole bunch of noise on the end of a sample that just doesn't need to be there. So I'm happy with that one. Let's have a quick look at Jack Kick. There's my Jack Kick. And you can see that does start too late. So let's just go in on the front of that sample, tighten that up. Cool. And same thing with Too Hard. And you can see that starts really late. So that's going to be quite significant. It's going to change the sound a whole lot. Now, do you hear that one also has a bit of a horrible noise on the end of it? So this is why it's really important to go into your sample editor and do look at that. Loads of loads of silence on the end of it too that we really don't need there. So let's just get in on the end of that and get rid of it. Wow, that's monstrous. And that's looking like you see there's there's an actual zero crossing there. There's actually I can see that we have something like silence there. So I've chosen that as the point to finish it. Let's have a listen. I can hear, still hear that kind of noise on the end, on the very end of it. So let's just tighten it up a little bit more. Let's go to there. You can hear that it's still there, just a little bit of it. And that's much, 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 much better. That's, that's a nice, clean, tight sample. So Let's just get rid of the sample editor. Let's have a th listen to the three kicks together. You can hear that sounds a lot better, tighter and everything. That's our three kicks. So what I then normally do is go in and layer together two or three snares, a couple of claps. I even layer hi-hats together. And I really like layering hi-hats. I'll never really layer more than two closed and two open. I don't think I've ever used three I had samples to create a new one. I don't tend to get into layering much beyond kicks, snares and hats and claps. Sometimes rims, I'll layer those together. You can get some really interesting little things going on. For instance, look, the, the general MIDI drum map always says that your kick is on C1. That's why I put the kick on C1. C sharp one is always a rim shot. D1 is always a snare drum. D sharp one is always a clap. F sharp, G sharp, A sharp are hats closed, pedaled, and open. So I always make sure that I put my kicks, my snares, my rims, my claps, and my hats onto those notes, those specific notes. And what can happen, for instance, is say in 10 years' time, I drag out an old song file that I was working on. I think, oh, I'd really like to actually get stuck into that song and do something with it. And say I've lost the sample cell or the, you know, the, the EXS24 instruments for it. If I've used C1 for the kick, D1 for the snare, etc., then it will be really easy for me to assign drum sounds to the parts and get them running. Whereas if I'd used, shall we say, G sharp 5 for my kick drum and F1 for the snare, etc., it could take hours just finding what each MIDI note is supposed to be sound like so it's really really good discipline to get into this um, general MIDI drum map <laughs>